So we will be starting the webinar shortly. We're just going to give everyone a couple more minutes to get settled in, and then we'll we'll get going. Okay, it looks like we have a, a good number of participants, so we'll get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to the National Kidney Foundation Renal Roundtable webinar on the uh, relationship of COVID and vitamin D in people with kidney disease. So um, I would like to give thanks to our, our sponsor, Opco Renal, who provided an unrestricted educational grant for us to facilitate this webinar. We have two uh, distinguished uh, presenters who are highly published experts in the area of vitamin D and health. Dr. William Grant is a director of the Sunlight Nutrition and Health Research Center in San Francisco. Dr. Grant will discuss uh, the observational studies and physiologic pathways linking vitamin D and COVID. Dr. Keith Norris is a nephrologist and a professor of medicine at UCLA Division of General Internal Medicine and Health Services Research and he will provide an overview of uh, COVID in the CKD population and uh, how low vitamin D levels um, common in this population might impact the incidence and severity of COVID. So before we get started, just uh, I wanted to let you know that we will be entertaining questions after each of the presentations. Uh, I would appreciate, uh, we would appreciate any and all questions and comments you have. You're welcome to either type your questions into the Q&A box at any time during this presentation or Actually, during the Q&A session, if you uh, hit the uh, raise your hand function, we'll unmute you and allow you to ask your question verbally. So, Dr. Grant. Okay, uh, let me just move this over here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm pleased to present what I know about vitamin D and COVID-19. Uh, next. I received funding from Biotech Pharmacal Inc. in Fayetteville, Arkansas, as a supplier of research grade vitamin D at three at low cost. I also work closely with two vitamin D advocacy organizations, grassrootshealth.net in California and vitamindwiki.com in Washington State. Next. So I'm gonna to try to cover a lot of material in 15 minutes. Uh, start with the observational studies of COVID-19 and 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Two interesting quasi-experimental studies of vitamin D supplementation of COVID-19 patients, two clinical trials of vitamin D treatment of COVID-19, uh, briefly the mechanisms of vitamin D and reducing COVID-19 risk, uh, talk about the SARS-CoV-2 seropositivity with respect to 25 reduction vitamin D, and related to that is the racial disparities of seropositivity. Um, then we'll talk about the age effects on COVID-19 you know, death rate and, and, and incidence rates. The seasonality of viral infections, such as influenza and, and COVID, uh, that peak in winter. Uh, some recommendations for vitamin D uh, regarding COVID-19 and where to go for more information. Next. So to date, there have been at least 15, perhaps more now, reports of COVID-19 with respect to serum 25 reduction vitamin D concentration. Most of these studies have reported inverse correlations uh, between uh, COVID-19 risk, severity, and our death with respect to serum 25 reduction vitamin D concentration. Uh, 
In general, uh, death is more pronounced for 25 hydroxyvitamin D below 10 nanograms per milliliter or 25 nanomoles per liter. Severe disease is often more below 20, uh, 20 nanograms. Moderate disease is more than 20 to 30 nanograms per milliliter range. And mild disease is more above 30 nanograms per milliliter. Just for reference, the average, the, the mean 25 hydroxyvitamin D concentration for white Americans is in the 20 to 30 nanogram uh, per milliliter range, uh, depending on the season, more like 20 in the winter and 30 in the summer. Uh, for African Americans, more like 16 nanograms per milliliter, and Hispanics, more like 20 nanograms per milliliter. Next. So here's an example of one of the observational studies. It's showing the uh, 25 hydroxy D versus severity in Austria for 109 COVID-19 patients aged uh, 58 plus or minus 14 years. And on the left, you see that um, the mild uh, cases are for um, 25 hydroxyvitamin D around uh, 65 nanomoles per liter, around 28 nanograms per milliliter. The moderate around uh, just over 20 nanograms per milliliter and severe around 20 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, of course, parathyroid hormone goes inverse to 25 hydroxyvitamin D since between vitamin D and parathyroid hormone, they regulate serum calcium very, very tightly. Next. And uh, here's a study from Germany showing that uh, patients with uh, 25 reduction vitamin D below 12 nanograms per milliliter are much more likely to die than those with a, a, above 12 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, next. So there are two quasi-experimental studies in, conducted in, in France. These are sort of um, accidental studies. Uh, the first one uh, involves 66 residents of a nursing home with, in France with recently diagnosed COVID-19. The mean age was 88 plus or minus nine years. Uh, the intervention was that 57 had received 80,000 units of vitamin D the previous month or within one week after diagnosis of COVID-19. So during the follow-up of 36 plus or minus 17 days, 83% of the supplemented residents survived, but only 44% of the comparator group, uh, this is nine who were not supplemented the same way. Um, uh, next, there was an, a second study by the same uh, group. Uh, in this case, they um, looked at 77 patients consecutively hospitalized for COVID-19 in a geriatric unit in France. The intervention groups uh, were participants regularly supplemented with vitamin D over the preceding year, generally about 50,000 IU per month, vitamin D3, or 80 to 100K every two to three months. Then there were those who were supplemented with 50,000 IU after the COVID-19 diagnosis. And there's also a comparative group not supplemented with vitamin D. Next. So you see at the top here, the group with regular uh, supplementation had a, a greatly decreased um, uh, risk of mortality. The recently supplemented group had a, a reduced risk, but it wasn't significant. Um, none of the other, let's see, they had a history of cancer, they had an increased risk of death. And if using corticosteroids, they had a almost significant increased risk of, of death. So this shows that uh, regular vitamin D supplementation uh, with high, really high dose, which is maybe around um, 3,000, 4,000 IU per day, uh, uh, but taken on a monthly basis, can greatly reduce the risk of death from COVID-19. Uh, and, and next, and so here's just a, a Captain Mayer estimates showing that uh, uh, how it happened. Okay, next. Now here is the first uh, large scale clinical trial. It was called a pilot clinical trial. Uh, it involved uh, 50 patients who were supplemented and 26 who were not supplemented. Uh, they um, all, this is in Cordoba, Alicante, Spain. Um, they were all given the same standard of care of a combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. The eligible patients were allocated to take oral calcifidial or not. Patients in the calcifidial treatment group continue with oral calcifidial on day three and seven and weekly until discharge. Note that calcifidial is 25 hydroxyvitamin D2 
and one week's treatment is 130, equivalent to 130,000 IU of vitamin D2. Calcifidial acts faster than vitamin D by a day or two due to bypassing conversion, the conversion process in the liver from vitamin D to 25-hydroxyvitamin D. So this is on the web, published in October. Next, and here are the outcomes. For those who are uh, supplemented with vitamin with the calcifidial, on, on the bottom we see that only one of them progressed to the uh, intensive care unit. But for the 26 in the control group, half of them, or uh, uh, 13 progressed to the ICU, and two persons uh, died. So it made quite a difference. The same group is now enrolling 1,000 people for a, a, a more com comprehensive uh, clinical trial. Um, Next. Now here's a, um, a short uh, high-dose vitamin D supplementation study in India. This involved 40 asymp asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 RNA positive uh, vitamin D deficient uh, individuals. They had 25 reduction vitamin D less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. They were admitted to a tertiary hospital in North India and they were without, without major comorbidities or requiring invasive ventilation by having 25 hydroxy vitamin D greater than 20 nanograms per million. So 16 of the intervention patients um, uh, aged 36 to 51 years had a mean 25 hydroxy vitamin D of nine nanograms per milliliter. The 24 controls uh, had a uh, mean 25 of 10 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, next. So 10 of the 16 patients um, re uh, re uh, achieved 50 nanograms per milliliter of, of 25 reduction vitamin D by day seven, and another two by day 14. Uh, the level of 52 in, in, in the intervention group and only 15 nanograms per milliliter in the control group. 10 of the participants in the intervention group and five in the control group became SARS-CoV-2 RNA negative. Fibrinogen levels significantly decrease with vitamin D supplementation, unlike the other inflammatory biomarkers. Next. So now that we see that, that evidently vitamin D uh, does have, has been shown both in correlational studies and in intervention studies to e affect the incidence or, or progression or the outcome of, of, of COVID-19, we can look now briefly at the mechanisms. So as you know, the, one, the, a primary source of vitamin D is through UVB radiation in the skin, uh, producing uh, uh, pre vitamin D, which through a thermal process becomes vitamin D3, goes to the liver where it becomes 25 reduction vitamin D, and then goes to the kidney um, or other organs uh, where it becomes 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Now this is the active form of vitamin D, and most of the action of vitamin D is through this active form, this hormonal version, uh, entering vitamin D receptors coupled to chromosomes and then affecting gene expression, perhaps 10 to 20% of the human genome, upregulating up maybe two thirds of those genes, downregulating others. Now, the, the green boxes show some of the uh, assumed or, or purported mechanisms. At the top, we have upregulation of antimicrobial peptides, such as cathelicidin or L, um, L037 and the defensins. We also have downregulation of things like tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon gamma. Um, we also have downregulation of inflammatory cytokines, um, upregulation of, of some autophagy, the macrophage, macrophages, and modulation of. Uh, matrix metallopeptidase 9, which has the action of, of um, this enzyme that um, uh, sort of destroys the extracellular matrix. It also upregulates IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So most of the action, most of the adverse action of, of COVID-19 is through a dysregulated immune system that overreacts and produces so many pro-inflammatory cytokines that it generates the cytokine storm. And, and that then goes to the surface, the epithelial layer, and does a lot of damage to the organs. This can be the 
the lungs, the arteries, the heart, the brain, et cetera, et cetera. So the effects on the respiratory system include downregulating acute respiratory tract infection, which has been shown in clinical trials, downregulating the inflammatory process, downregulating asthma and COPD exasperation, and increasing lung function. Next. So um, some of the effects are found that um, um, age and age-related comorbidities, such as dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, are determined in more frequent severe forms of disease. This is a, a study in Spain with 584 cases. In the case are older than those so far reported in the clinical course of disease is found to be impaired by age. And they're suggesting that immunosenescence might be therefore a suitable explanation for the hampering of the immune system effectors. The adaptive immunity would become exhausted and a strong but ineffective and almost deleterious innate immune response would account for COVID-19 severity. Angiotensin converting uh, enzyme inhibitors also used by hypertensive patients have a protective effect in regards to COVID-19 severity in our series. Next. So now turning to the um, data on seropositivity as a function of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So these are data taken by Quest Diagnostics. The, uh, I think it was from March to April uh, for the, for the seropositivity uh, uh, measurements. The 25 hydroxy vitamin D data were from the previous 12 months and um, uh, seasonally adjusted. So the value at 20 is actually 20 or lower 25 hydroxy vitamin D and uh, it goes up to around 55 or 60, it's, it's 60 or more at the other end. So you see that um, the seropositivity decreases rapidly as you increase in 25 hydroxy vitamin D down by a factor of two up to 50 or 60 nanograms per milliliter. But since, as I mentioned, most whites are in the 20 to 30 nanograms per milliliter range and blacks around the 15 nanograms per milliliter range, you see that most people are where they don't have much protection from, from, with vitamin D against the seropositivity. The next slide shows that um, if you look at the bottom one, it shows that the black non-Hispanics have roughly twice the seropositivity of whites and Hispanics have about 50% 50, 50 higher. Now you see that blacks and Hispanics also have a, 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 a variation with 25 hydroxy vitamin D, um, but they, they also have a lot of non-vitamin D risk factors such as living in large groups, uh, working at more of the service level where they have to interact with a lot of people, um, probably taking public transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, so the, the vitamin D aspect uh, at the, their level is only a minor part, but if they could uh, increase the 25 hydroxy vitamin D by supplementation, they could reduce their seropositivity by about 30%. Uh, next. Uh, this is just a slide from India showing that it's the older people who tend to die, it's the younger people who tend to get COVID-19. Of course, the younger people can infect the older people, so I, 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 you don't want to just base, a, base a rec, a public health recommendations on uh, the, um, those who are dying. Next. Uh, now, look at this. This is seasonality of viral infections. On the left, we have the coronaviruses, and the coronaviruses include uh, many of the viruses that are non-lethal that cause common colds. Then there's the, in the middle of the influenza-like viruses, and then you have RSV. And what you see is that in above 25 degrees north latitude, all these have a very strong seasonal effect. And in fact, the seasonal effects seem to be stronger in January, February, than in, uh, but in November, December starts it's ramping up. And this has a number of factors, risk factors. This includes temperature and humidity and the solar UV, which affect the ability of the virus to live outside the human body. So in summer, when it's hot and, uh, and maybe not so humid, uh, the virus doesn't last very long. But in the winter, when it's cold, uh, not uh, relative humidity is up and the UVB is gone, it uh, can last longer. Go to the next slide. This just shows the, the, that in um, Northern Europe, the peak is around February. Go to the next slide. And you see they've accounted for this in terms of temperature, 
the UV index and humidity being the primary factors. And so these are probably what's driving the, the um, you know, the fact that these are in the wrong uh, season now is what's driving the, the seasonal increase. But this also means we've got another several months of, of very severe COVID-19. Next slide. This just shows the seasonal variation of, of 25 hydroxy vitamin and PTH in the US. And so um, the blue on the bottom is showing that the lowest 25 hydroxy vitamin D is around middle of February. Um, and so as we proceed in, in December, so we're, we're, people are reducing their 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is also gonna contribute to the, the epidemiology. Next, recommendations. So the people at most risk are healthcare workers who are dealing with COVID-19 patients, uh, the elderly, the obese, those with chronic diseases, those with lung diseases, those with high social contact and occupation, institution, or living arrangement. Uh, also those, uh, of course, those recently diagnosed with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 positivity. So recommend would be taking a bolus dose of vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D3 is preferred uh, vitamin D2 is not as good, even though that is what can more easily be prescribed by physicians. It doesn't last as long in the body, and it hasn't been shown to be as effective in, in fighting disease. Although the two of the studies I showed, uh, two of the studies recently did use vitamin D2 and had good results. So you take the bolus dose to rapidly raise 25 hydroxy D concentration, then you, uh, it will rise in, in a few days, within a week. And then you follow by, by whatever reasonable daily doses uh, you think are important. You also want to consider if you're doing bolus dosing and probably even, even daily dosing, a uh, supplement with magnesium as well because uh, vitamin D uses magnesium um, in uh, doing some of its actions. And also you might want to consider vitamin K2 so that the calcium is, is directed to the hard tissues like the bones and, and, and rather, rather than the soft tissues such as the arteries. And um, there have been very few adverse effects of high dose vitamin D supplementation. Uh, and that when it happens, is usually people taking a mislabeled 25 redox, uh, vitamin D, taking 10 to 100 times the normal dose. And then after a month or two, they get hypercalcemia. Kidney stones are not related to uh, vitamin D supplementation for the most part. Next. So uh, I have a new uh, publication um, uh, I published at Nutrients um, regarding the uh, vitamin D and risk of COVID-19 severity. It discusses about 14 observational studies, um, um, uh, three intervention studies, the mechanism and so on. It's open access. You can find it through PubMed or scholar.google.com or go to Nutrients and search for it there. Uh, next. Uh, so for searching, you can go, like I said, to PubMed, scholar.google.com, and also the two vitamin D advocacy organizations, grassrootshealth.net and vitamindwiki.com. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Grant. So we would be happy to uh, take any questions. Um, I see we have uh, one question uh, in the chat box. It says, has vitamin D in combination with zinc been studied? Uh, yes, uh, zinc has been recommended for uh, preventing and treating um, uh, COVID-19 as well. Uh, I, 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 my, I, I take uh, my, my zinc pills, say 50 milligrams. I haven't really studied the, um, the, the required dose, but yes, that is also recommended. And vitamin C, I might mention that there are advocates who recommend high dose vitamin C for fighting COVID-19. Um, I won't go into that either, but you can look it up on the, on the web. Okay, so we have a, another question here. Um, uh, for renal dialysis patients, uh, I, I think the question is, what would you recommend as a dose? You mentioned have, receiving a bolus uh, how much vitamin D would you give to dialysis patients? I'll let Keith handle that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The probably. next the next question is sort of related as well. What is the mega dose of vitamin D three recommended? So um, around maybe two hundred thousand IU um, in a day or two, um, one hundred fifty to two hundred, maybe a bit more. All right. 
Yeah, I would just say um, rather than using vitamin D2 or D3, uh, ergo cholecalciferol, usually it's uh, uh, calcipodiol, um, 25 hydroxy D3, which is then more easily converted to 125. And so there's both short acting and long acting. And, um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I, I think that's uh, another great question. And, and without, you know, data is minimal. On a personal note, I take vitamin D and I take zinc. I take 5,000 a day. <laughs> so the next question is, is there a, a difference between uh, man-made vitamin D and uh, UVB vitamin D? Uh, vitamin D3 that's sold in supplements is normally from sheep's wool lanolin that's been UVB irradiated and purified and has the same electric structure as what we make in our skin. Vitamin D2 comes from fungi or, or yeast, and that has a different molecular formula, and that's why it's not as effective as D3. So that's, that's ergocalciferol, whereas vitamin D3 is cholecalciferol. Uh, there's a question about whether vitamin D supplementation, in your experience, is it good for people's moods? Uh, yes. Um, the way I like to think about it is you feel good in the sun while you're making vitamin D and nature always has a, a habit of, of giving the pleasure uh, uh, reward for things that are good for you, like eating good food, having friends and that sort of thing. But there have been studies showing it does have some effect on mood and, and depression. Okay. And I would, I would just That's add to back. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to go back to the dialysis question. Uh, although there's really no data for um, in thinking what a, a large dose is, particularly in thinking about patient with COVID, but in general, the use for the uh, extended release, 25-hydroxy-D uh, uh, would be 30 or 60 micrograms. Okay. So uh, COVID patients tend to be overweight. What is the influence of body weight on the ability of vitamin D to raise serum 25D? So um, you can think of it as dilution, that um, uh, people that are twice as large as normal people might take twice as much vitamin D. However, there are many factors that affect how the conversion from, 25, from vitamin D to 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And the only real way to know whether you're getting the, the level you want is to have your, your concentration measured. Okay. There's a follow-up in regards to the, the uh, mega dose or the, the bolus dose, and, and that is what, what would be the daily dosing you would give and for how long after that large dose? I'd recommend 5,000 IU per day. I mean, in my case, I'm up to around 60 nanograms per milliliter taking, but I weigh 135 pounds. So and you, you want to be around we're now saying that the optimal 25 hydroxy vitamin D is around 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. That's based on observational studies of people taking vitamin D supplementation, not exactly in a clinical trial. The problem with clinical trials is they've often based these studies on vitamin D dose. They've often been limited by the um, Food and Drug Administration to 2,000 IU per day, uh, maybe 4,000 IU per day. They often don't measure 25 hydroxy vitamin D in the study, and they find gee golly, vitamin D didn't do anything. But uh, like grassroots health has been involved in observational studies with people taking uh, whatever vitamin D they, dose they wanted, maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000 IU per day, getting up to 60, 70 nanograms per milliliter and showing effects on uh, reducing preterm birth, reducing uh, risk of cancer, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, the, the Institute of Medicine based their recommendation of 20 nanograms per milliliter and 800 IU per day of vitamin D on bone health. We now know that, that cancer and, and diabetes and, and depression and all these non-skeletal effects require higher 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And as one of the questioners, uh, audience member asked, yes, vitamin D works as a, uh, a hormone. Uh, it's something we can make. I mean, vitamins are normally something you cannot make. Uh, but it, it actually, uh, the 125 acts as a hormone. 
All right, a couple more questions here and then we'll move on. Is there a better better grade of uh, the different manufacturers of vitamin D or? I think they're all pretty much the same. Um, of course, the biotech um, Pharmacal it has research grade vitamin D and it's available through the internet. It can also be prescribed in some pharmacies where you can request your pharmacy to um, prescribe it. And one more and then we'll move on. Vitamin D is fat soluble. Can you build up enough in the fat tissues to cause side effects? Um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, the, the, the worst case scenario is uh, um, a vitamin and mineral guru who's taking mislabeled vitamin D taking a million IU per day. After a month or two, he had, he was physically a wreck, couldn't think straight, called in Michael Hollick and found out that he was taking a million ID and IU per day. And he was up to 900 nanograms per milliliter. So Michael helped him uh, just lower his serum levels over a month or two. And when he got down below 400 nanograms per milliliter, his hypercalcemia disappeared. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's not a major problem. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Grant, and thank you for all the great questions. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Keith Norris. Just a second. <clears throat> thank you, Tom, and um, good evening to all the participants. Thank you for joining us, and we'll, we'll move forward here because we want to keep you up too late. Uh, next slide. I do some consulting in Puerto Rico for a dialysis company where I do uh, QI work. And I have several NIH grants, but none that are related to this topic. Next. So I'm gonna give a little overview of COVID-19 and chronic kidney disease. I wanna reinforce some of the um, aspects about vitamin D and immune response that Dr. Grant discussed. And then take a look at COVID-19, chronic kidney disease and vitamin D. What do we know and where do we go from here? Next. So as we all know, uh, COVID-19 can induce an exaggerated inflammatory response. And as we heard from Dr. Grant, vitamin D is a key modulator of the immune system. And patients with chronic kidney disease in particular have baseline alterations of the immune system. Patients also have low levels of vitamin D. And so I'm not really gonna talk about that because we know that pretty well. And that patients with chronic kidney disease may be at increased risk for COVID-19 infection and for COVID-19 complications. So I'm gonna take a little look at some of the data that we have uh, in regards to that. Next. So this is from a, a recent review by um, um, uh, Nature Reviews Nephrology. And this takes a look at medical risk factors for COVID-19 related death. So we know age is a very powerful um, risk factor for death. But when we look at the medical conditions in purple, you see chronic kidney disease with anywhere from two to four fold adjusted hazard uh, ratio for death and transplantation, solid organ transplantation, including kidney transplantation. That again is uh, close to a four fold hazard ratio for death. Slightly lower, still an increased risk, morbid obesity and poorly controlled diabetes at a two fold adjusted risk for death and then other respiratory diseases at a nearly twofold, one and a half to twofold. But importantly, chronic kidney disease, when we look at medical risk conditions, is as high or higher than any of the other medical risk conditions as reported through this review. Next. So next I wanna address how common is COVID-19 infections in the hemodialysis uh, population. And this was, the next few slides are from a recent report from Candace Clark and colleagues who looked at two dialysis units and there were 376 dialysis patients and 356 consented to participate in this project. And of that 356, they found that nearly 34% were symptomatic when they were screened or had previously had symptoms. And then about two thirds had no symptoms, and so they did not do a, a PCR test for active COVID, but they did actually look at antibodies. Next. So we're gonna follow the, 
this sort of orange here. So it says, let's look at the 79 of 356 or nearly 20% of COVID-19 dialysis patients who are um, RT-PCR positive. And if we follow down to your right on the screen, you see, um, again, 79 or 22% are positive. And of that, 77 were antibody positive and two were antibody negative. So of individuals who were PCR positive, only two did not seroconvert. Next. <clears throat> if we look at the middle cohort, those that had um, symptoms, but were PCR negative, even though they were PCR negative, nearly 20% were found to be antibody positive. Next. And then if we look at the group who had no symptoms, and so they did not have um, PCR for COVID done, for COVID infection done, but when they looked at uh, whether or not they were COVID antibody positive or not, again, nearly 20% had were found to be COVID antibody positive. Next. <clears throat> so to summarize, in the, across these two hemodialysis units, a uh, fairly high percentage were COVID antibody positive, a little more than a third. And importantly, 20% of dialysis patients with no symptoms, or 20% who were symptoms but were PCR negative were found to be antibody positive. Only two people did not seroconvert who were PCR positive. And so what we have is uh, in our dialysis population or a large number of individuals without symptoms or who are PCR negative but subsequently found to be positive and it says one, our diagnostic screening may be somewhat limited in our ability to detect acute infection. And it also means we have to have a low threshold of, or a high threshold of sensitivity because we could have a large number of patients with no symptoms or who had symptoms, but came back with a negative PCR test, but they still could have active infection as demonstrated here by subsequently them becoming antibody positive. Next. So I'm going to shift gears for a second and take a quick look again in a little more detail at the vitamin D and uh, vitamin D and the immune response. Next. So a brief history. Uh, Rook and colleagues in 1986 um, did some uh, analysis, some studies in human monocytes and um, reported vitamin D3 to have a very influential and a regulatory um, role in the proliferation of mycobacteria. And, and this was sort of one of the first studies suggesting vitamin D had a very strong um, role in the immune system. A year later, we were in the process of doing some studies looking at high dose intravenous vitamin D in patients with severe secondary hyperparathyroidism. These are dialysis patients. And so we looked at, the, uh, we, we looked at uh, lymphocyte proliferation and suppressor cell ratios in those dialysis patients with severe hy secondary hyperparathyroidism before and after high dose vitamin D. And we were unable to confirm those in vitro findings. So we sort of abandoned the situation then and felt that maybe we weren't able to see anything in, in, in a clinical setting, but several years later, um, several other studies did suggest there's clinical effect. And then Lou and uh, John Adams and Robert Mod Modlin and others uh, participated on this project, looking at toll receptors and found this relationship with vitamin D made mediated human antimicrobial response. And that's what really pushed the field forward for vitamin D and the immune function. Next. And it's just sort of highlighted here, we have a, a, a um, image of a macrophage with toll-like receptors at the top of the uh, macrophage. And once those toll-like receptors are activated by pathogens, they increase uh, CYP27B1 or 1-hydroxylase to activate uh, 25D to, to 125D. It then activates the vitamin D receptor 
and there's a cascade of events that are triggered by activation of the vitamin D receptor, including the activation of defensins and cathelicidin, which uh, Dr. Grant mentioned earlier. And that plays an important role in killing bacteria and, um, and, so, and, and in the uh, mycobacteria that uh, were examined by Lou and colleagues. Next. Next. But similarly, it appears that this same process leads to uh, antiviral actions with uh, autophagy of, and viral clearance. Uh, again, through the same mechanism, toll-like receptors leading subsequently to the activation of vitamin D receptors and cathelicidin, defensins, uh, mTOR being activated, and a variety of factors that ultimately have a potential uh, positive effect on clearing viruses. Next. Another pathway that vitamin, where vitamin D may play a role, or, and evidence suggests it does, is that of the antioxidant response element and oxidative stress and inflammation within the cell. And particularly patients with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, other stressful conditions of chronic diseases, they may have a, a reduction in uh, NRF2, a subdued uh, response to antioxidants, and an upregulation and increase in inflammatory mediators, as Dr. Grant mentioned. Next. And so we see this upregulation of uh, antioxidants and downregulation of, in, uh, next, one more, and one more. So we see that uh, vitamin D helps to normalize the inflammatory response and the antioxidant response that commonly resides in patients with diabetes and with chronic kidney disease. And so potentially by decreasing these inflammatory mediators, it can help to attenuate the cytokine storm and cytokine response, at least theoretically, that we see in patients, such as uh, patients with kidney disease, uncontrolled diabetes, that were two of the medical conditions associated with some of the highest risk of death in that report from Nature Review. Next. And this just uh, highlights the effect of uh, vitamin D receptor activation and in this particular study, looking at rats using maxacalcitol, and, uh, and the screen on the left, there's uh, two, um, two sets of images. And what we see is uh, NRF2 on the far left and uh, should be keep right next to it. And in the Sprague Dolly rats that are control and diabetes treated with insulin, we see levels that are similar, and then you see a very low bar for a group called DM, and that's diabetes without treatment. So NRF2 is very low there, and next to it is OCT, which is maxacalcitol, given to the diabetes mellitus with, that are not receiving insulin, and it's able to normalize the NRF2. It increases it to normal range. Similarly, we see the uh, similar response with uh, KEEP1, where KEEP1 is very high in the rats with diabetes without insulin, and then it's normalized when they're given um, maxacalcitol. And on the far right panel, we see um, two, two panels there. One is uh, tissue uh, NF-kappa B score, and the other is tissue NFB cap activity. And again, we see the, uh, the rats with diabetes having very high levels of tissue NF-kappa B and inflammatory marker being very high and that the addition of maxacalcitol and activating the vitamin D receptor, uh, bringing those levels back to or close to normal. Next. Well, what about in patients? Well, this is a study from uh, Ravi Tadani and colleagues at Harvard where they looked at the association between uh, mortality on the vertical axis and uh, cathelicidin levels by tertiles, the lowest tertile having, uh, looking at one year survival, the lowest tertile, 62% of patients survived 
whereas in the second and third tertiles with the higher levels of cathelicidin, a uh, little over 75% of the patients survived. So again, observational data suggesting uh, at least a, an important uh, clinical role for uh, cathelicidin as an um, important factor in outcomes. Next. So to sort of summarize COVID infections and kidney disease, one, um, much higher mortality in patients with chronic kidney disease, highly prevalent in patients with chronic kidney disease, and vitamin D is a key modulator of the immune system, um, particularly in patients with advancing chronic kidney disease, or at least we would conceptualize that this would be particularly important in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, or even more likely to have low levels of vitamin D, and, and therefore more likely to have uh, immune system regulation as well, or immune system dysregulation as well. Next. So patients with chronic kidney disease may be at increased risk for COVID-19 infection and for COVID-19 complications. Next. So COVID-19, chronic kidney disease, and vitamin D. So now Dr. Grant and I have both gone through a lot of this stuff. What do we know and where do we go from here? Next. Well, we really, we really know very little. That, that's, that's what the data is and that's what we have right now. So we have, we're, so what we're trying to do is put together some pieces to come up with some uh, potential strategies in the absence of having hardcore data, but, but linking together observations and, and things that we hope would be rational approaches. Next. Next. So uh, Dr. Fauci and colleagues recently uh, had this viewpoint um, in JAMA and it's titled Therapy for Early COVID-19, A Critical Need. And in there, they note treatment of outpatients with mild disease must be safe with few adverse effects, easy to administer and scalable. Next. And so when we're thinking about pharmacal prevention, you know, again, prevention, the timing, can we do something to either, either prevent or do early intervention, targeting high-risk populations, elderly, chronic kidney disease, and then we want something with a very low risk profile, all right, because our goal is first do no harm. Uh, next, yeah. So there are several uh, interventions that have been studied or examined for uh, intervention, uh, potentially early, Fluvoxamine was recently reported um, in JAMA to be highly effective or, uh, for patients with early uh, COVID and reducing hospitalization, but it was one study and, um, and it's thought to work as a, again, anti-inflammatory uh, properties as a SSR inhibitor. Hydroxychloroquine, which also has anti-inflammatory properties has been uh, tried in many studies usually for patients in hospital has not been effective for, for prevention. Uh, data is still uh, equivocal, so there, and there are other studies ongoing. But the risk profile for both of those is not inconsequential, and particularly for patients with chronic kidney disease who are on multiple medications. Vitamin D, again, uh, data is equivocal, but we have a great risk profile, right? And so the clinical benefits of vitamin D, if they're gonna be there, uh, based on some of the data we presented, really appear to more likely be of benefit in high risk subgroups, those with low 25 D levels to start out with, those with multimorbidity and high oxidative stress, who are likely to have an increased inflammatory response and therefore, um, which could be exacerbated by low vitamin D and therefore, vitamin D repletion could help to ameliorate that risk. Next. So patients with uh, stage three and four chronic kidney disease have uh, high rates of 25D deficiency uh, associated with poor outcomes as Dr. Grant showed us. Uh, our uh, recent recommendation from a scientific work group from the National Kidney Foundation suggested for patients with three and four with stage three and four CKD and 25D levels less than 15 nanograms per milliliter, they should be treated 
irrespective of PTH level, those between 15 and 20, if there's evidence of counter-regulatory hormone activity, increase PTH. But that nutri nutritional vitamin D, cholecalciferol, ergocalciferol, calcifediol, uh, should be used before using activated vitamin D. And as we heard earlier, um, calcifediol probably we're able to generate higher levels without um, the massive, the higher doses that we see needed with choline and ergocalciferol, particularly with more advanced CKD. Next. So during the pandemic, we also have shelter in place. So what does that do? Less sunlight exposure. So it probably further lowers vitamin D levels and therefore that may further suppress innate immunity. And that could be even worse for our patients with advanced chronic kidney disease. I don't think anybody's looked at that specifically, but it's something we need to be cognizant of. Next. So should we be recommending routine nutritional vitamin D supplementation for CKD patients during COVID-19? I'm not absolutely sure, but it's something that we should definitely be thinking about, okay? Next. This is a list, so there are trials ongoing looking at a variety of different forms of vitamin D in COVID-19 including um, cholecalciferol, ergocalciferol, and calcifediol. And so hopefully uh, as, as more data comes forward, we will have, we'll be able to say with more confidence what some recommendations might be. Next. So again, coming back to this uh, critical need and, and this uh, comment from that article by Dr. Fauci that the treatments should be safe few adverse effects, easy to administer, and scalable. Next. So although efficacy has not yet been established, we do know that vitamin D is safe with few adverse effects. We know it's easy to administer, and we know it's scalable. So I think it's something we should really be thinking about for our patients. Um, it's a clinical decision for everybody to make, and um, it's, uh, but we just want to present some data to suggest to, to provide some support for people who might be inclined to, to administer it to their patients. And again, I think although the efficacy is still debatable, the safety, I think, is not debatable. The ease of administration is not debatable, and the scalability is not debatable. Next. So I'll answer some questions, but on behalf of um, Sarah Kim, Dr. Grant, Tom Manley, and the NKF, we want to thank everybody for your attention. We want to wish you all the best in navigating through COVID-19. We want you to stay well, shelter in place, take time to reinvent home life, and we want you to be safe while you're home enjoying your holidays. And again, we'll, uh, I'll try to entertain some questions. I'm not sure I can answer them, but I'll try to entertain some along with Dr. Grant. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Norris. So we have a couple questions. We'd certainly love more. Um, the first question is, Can uh, is there similar results in PD patients as HD? And I'm not sure if that's related to prevalence or treatment, but. Um, yeah, that's a great question. We don't, I have not seen data in peritoneal dialysis patients. Um, I think one would, one might, hypothesize that the prevalence would likely be lower in PD patients because their exposure is less. They're not in and out of the facility all the time and around both um, medical staff and other patients who are at high risk. So hopefully by being home, their risk with, for um, prevalence of uh, COVID infection, uh, my, my sense is would be lower, but I don't, but there's no data on that right now. Okay. So the next is a, actually a couple questions together and I'll just ask them both. So is CYP27B1 regulated in macrophages from infected patients? In other words, will LL37 be produced by these macrophages in proportion to the degree to which serum total 25D is elevated? Um, theoretically, so I, 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 I'm not sure I've seen studies looking at the levels of, so to look at this, we'd really look at it 
in probably in cell cultures. And I don't know if there's data looking at the, the level of 25D uh, sort of infecting the cells, looking at the activation of the of, of CYP of, and 27B and, and then conversion to 125D and then activation of cathelicidin. But it seems that um, there would be, if, if there's no 25D, there's no substrate that can't go forward. But I don't know if, if you make more and more available, if, if, if it just continues to go. So it probably has a rate limiting a point where the, where the conversion is limited. But I think the key is in the absence or in low 25D, it, what we do know is there, we do have low levels of cathelicidin and we do have an inability, at least for mycobacteria to kill the mycobacteria. Okay, uh, next question. So um, would you advise giving 5,000 IUs of vitamin D in the absence of COVID-19, just in case one gets it? Um, so part of it would depend on the stage of CKD. So an earlier stage, but I, you know, you can go 2,000. I think one could easily go 2,000 IU and feel comfortable, but at, at with more advanced levels, you might need 5,000, or you might want to go to um, calcifidiol, where there's probably maybe with 30 micrograms, where you're probably more likely to have a stable and sustained increase in 25D in, in the patient with CKD. Uh, next question. Do you have any experience in the administration of vitamin D in children with CKD and COVID-19? So I have zero experience there and I, and I am aware of zero data there. So but I think it's a great question. I'll ask some of my colleagues and find out, or if there's someone on the, if there's some other panelists, so, some other attendee who has some experience, we'd love for them to um, at least jot in their experience and some of that. Uh, so we see one of the panelists who had COVID, sorry to hear that, hopefully you're better. And their C-reactive protein went up very high. So again, confirming the, um, this, uh, in high, this inflammatory response to COVID and the increased inflammatory state I hope uh, our wishes to you that your recovery is uh, full and hopefully quick, swift. Any other questions? Any other answers? <laughs> there you go. Good to hear that uh, Ali Edwards is better, good. All right, then once again, we wanna wish everybody all the best to be safe, um, enjoy the holidays, but do it in a, in a safe way. And again, we wanna thank the National Kidney Foundation for, uh, for sponsoring this and OPCO for their um, support of the National Kidney Foundation. All right, thank you everyone. Good night. All right. Good night.